Welcome back to Naval Action and episode 51 of A Letter to the King. If you're new to the series or you've been away, away from the game and you're thinking about coming back to it or just trying to keep in touch, this is my attempt to keep you up to date with what's happening in the PvP on the Euro PvP1 server. Let's remind ourselves of where we were after last week. So last week was one of the busiest weeks we've ever seen. Over uh, maybe about 30 port battles across the board. Uh, somewhat dominated by US night flipping action where they moved into the north of Haiti, uh, onto the coast uh, on the north of South America proper um, and snaffled up uh, Costa del Fuego amongst other regions. Um, and much grumpiness was uh, abounding, um, not only in the comments section of my video, but generally on the forums with a couple of hundred posts about night flipping and their evils. How would we all respond? How would the server respond to such shenanigans? So the alliances are locked in stone, it appears, although there is some movement in the British alliance this week. There's a bit of a split, a bit of a a factional split. We had this with the Dutch nation three or four months ago. It persisted for a while and resulted in one of the big Dutch clans joining the Americans. So what is the split about with the British? Um, well, basically there's two or three clans who like to do things in a very organized fashion. Um, they sort of campaign in areas. They raise hostility up at precise times. Uh, but then when it comes to the port battles themselves, they sort of have a list of who's going in. Um, only people with the right ships get to go in, and to some extent only captains that perhaps are trusted by the port battle commander get to go in. And this is seen by two or three or four of the other clans as being a little bit elitist. And what they prefer is a more sort of fun and... Um, open to all and let the noobs have a go type of approach to the game. Um, we saw this in the defense uh, at Pedro K, where it was very much uh, let anybody in who wants to have a go. Although it has to be said, it was actually organized by, uh, commanded by someone, if you like, from this group. So what we've got at the moment in the Brits is a group who like to do things very organized. Um, they've been accused of being elitist and a group who are more about inclusion and giving everybody a go. Which is better? Neither. They're both completely valid ways to play the game. If there's 25 people who want to run up a port battle and then decide who gets to go in it in what type of ships, that's completely okay. If there's 25 people who want to run up a port battle and then have a crack at it, with a far more relaxed and open and inclusive attitude to it, that's okay too. Unfortunately, there are protagonists um, throwing a bit of monkey poo at each other and um, being a bit disruptive. And that doesn't help anybody in my opinion. So these are two completely valid models for playing the game. They can coexist. They've always coexisted really. It's just bubbled to the surface more overtly in recent times. And so uh, a bit of a fracture has appeared. So now we have, if you like, the organized clans, which is two or three clans. And then this big group over here called the House of Commons. Um, and then, of course, all the normal folks who just potter around doing their daily gubbins. So right now there is a bit of a rift in the, the British nation, uh, which is a bit of a concern, but not really. Because the organized guys are still doing the organized stuff and the fun inclusive guys are still doing their stuff. So I bid you all to enjoy your naval action no matter which way you play it and stop throwing shit at the other guys. Um, if you're an organized guy with your elitist, I only take in stronghold, four gold modded um, ships with sailors who can shoot fridges out their ass, that's fine. Um, but it's equally valid that you rock up to a port battle in seconds and third rates if that's all you've got to hand and just give it a crack and have a laugh. I know I did that with the Aussies, a uh, bunch of Aussie players when we had a little go around here and it was great fun. Um, it was as much fun as the organised attack I participated in on Castries this morning. 
So they're both valid ways of playing it. Stop throwing shit at each other. Doesn't help anybody. And I know there's some very good players who are a bit upset with how they've been treated or perceived to be treated well. Um, they're really good fun people that we like to have in the British nation. So let's not piss anybody off. Uh, this was an advert brought to you by Harmony. Harmony in the British nation for all. All right, now let's get on to killing. So... Operation Spanky Yank seemed to have been, I don't know if it was an organised thing by our Eastern Alliance uh, brethren, but the first half a dozen battles of the week were all against American-held targets. So the US first met um, the Biff in Andros where the Danes came, and the Danes seem to have um, got the hang of this shallow water battle stuff recently. And the shallow water battles are very interesting. The ships zip around, they turn through the wind like you wouldn't believe. You probably only land half your cannon shots because you're bobbing around like a cork in a in a, in, in the sea. Um, and the Danes out tacticed the uh, alliance in this one and um, managed to sink a few extra ships, but they also um, managed to dominate the circles, running quickly from circle to circle. So Andros fell. Um, and then in what was becoming a bit of a worry for the Americans, the Spanish came at Islamadora. Of course, this is all outside of the American uh, main time and in the European main time. Uh, so a bit of a hodgepodge fleet tried to hold off uh, the Spanish, but the Spanish played it well. And they, um, in a sort of forthright version of Andorus, they basically uh, they took a couple of ship advantage and uh, whittled the circles down. And so uh, Costa del Fuego fell to... Um, the Spanish, um, the Swedes then attacked um, at Abaco, I think it's called, and uh, but this was held uh, by the US, um, and then the US were then hit again at Islamadora. Uh, this was a really interesting battle. It ended up uh, being a, a, a defence by the US. Uh, I think in the end it was only like. Four ships were lost on the Spanish side, maybe to one ship on the US side, a real slugfest. And circles changing back and forth, but the Americans uh, held out there, I think, in the end. Uh, it only probably took them an hour to get the points up on the board, so they did well with the circles. The Americans were then hit again at Los Lanas, um, where the Spanish tried to take back the north side of Cuba here. That Spanish flag should be over there. I'll sack the staff later on. Uh, but the Americans managed to help uh, hold uh, Los Lanas. So al although they lost a couple of uh, port engagements, they did manage to hold at Los Lanas. Um, however, they weren't able to hold down in Cumana. The French came down at Cumana and um, they've pushed the Americans out of the southern part of the map. So three defeats for the U.S., um, all pretty much in a two-day period with them losing Costa del Fuego, um, Andros, and Cumana. Um, then there was a bit of a surprise attack by the Brits at Trinidad. Um, I think this is a first-rate battle, but it was this was fought very differently by the Brits. They used very different tactics. Um, they basically locked the Spanish up in their initial circle and sort of fought the fight where it doesn't matter to some extent after they entered with reasonable wind. Uh, not great wind, but reasonable wind. And they took um, the first circle, sent a ship to snaffle the second circle. And then they pretty much held the Spanish um, in mid-waters. Um, and two separate battles converged into one. And in the end, the Brits, I think, ran out something like 11 or 12 ships sunk for the Spanish to only losing three ships for the Brits. So this was a big win, and it really pushes the Spanish back now just to the tip uh, of Cuba. And it's been a long time since so little real estate has been held by the Spanish on what is sort of the motherland, as it were. Um... So that was a bit of a surprise attack and a bit of a surprise win for the Brits there. Um, and that's a good uh, a good first-rate win. They're hard to come by first-rate wins, as we've all seen. It's hard to get through the screens apart from anything else. Uh, the Brits, however, were then uh, attacked 
up in the shallows at New Providence. And again, this was this Dane shallow water fleet who right now seem to have the, the better of the tactics in the shallow water battles. And they vanquished the Brits, uh, taking New Providence, uh, which of course is where Nassau is. I've just, just literally just come from watching the latest episode of Black Sails. So that's very good. Um, so that was the Danes uh, winning at NASA. I don't remember any Danes in Black Sails, but there you go. Um, obviously, I'm not up to that episode yet. But So the Danes have captured NASA. Um, the French then came for Orinoco. Um, and if you remember, this is this port that's got all the three circles in a row. It's a bit like Wilmington. These two ports are kind of mirrors of each other. Um, and this was actually a great battle. There is a video up on the national channel for this. This is a great video. Um, it was a really well fought battle. In the end, the Brits held quite convincingly. I think uh, they only allowed the opponents to get something like 125 points on the board by the time the battle closed. Um, but it was a it was a well contested battle, and the Brits managed to hold on to Orinoco for yet another week. Uh, meanwhile. Um, as happens frequently, the French were attacked at Les Cays. Now, this was a night flip, and this was probably defence of the week to the French. Um, they were two ships down, I think, because it was a daft o'clock for them. Um, and despite being two ships down, and despite not having the world's best wind, uh, basically by managing fights in two of the circles and spreading their fleet... Uh, but doing so in a way that they, they, they managed to choose two circles where they had even fights and then their, uh, a couple of ships were capped. I mean, there was only five ships lost, I think, by the US, but a couple of ships were capped, which meant the circle where the Americans were winning didn't really matter. It was the circles where they weren't winning, it sounds a bit obvious when you say it like that, where it did matter, but they couldn't then send their ships there. So in the end, this was a, a, a stoic defence, I think, um, to the, the French. Um, and so Les Cays, well, that's the wrong way around. Um, Les Cays was held once again, and that's, uh, there's a lot of blood in the water and on the sand around Les Cays. And the Americans then had a crack at Costa del Fuego. Um, this was one where they had a two-ship Advan no, the, the Americans, um, basically, I think they lost nine ships to three. Um, and all, no, in fact, that's right, this was a weird one. Sorry, I'm reading my notes and they're a bit upside down here. The Americans actually killed more ships early on than the Spanish, but they never owned the circles. So although the Americans looked like they were going to win this at the start, um, with the circles being held three circles being held, the clock really ticks up real quick. And um, the Spanish essentially managed to, to, to hold this one and ended up, I think, sinking nine of the American ships uh, for a loss of three. So the Spanish held at Costa del Fuego. Um, the next battle was at La Vega, where the Americans again came under the cosh from uh, the Danes. Now this was obviously in European prime time, so the Americans really scrambled together a fleet. And of course, these are the flags it was, it was, the, the battles were sailed under. In almost all cases, you've got allies from both sides helping in these battles. Um, and this was a real every man and his dog fleet. I think um, the Brits had one guy in a car park playing on his laptop uh, and after 10 minutes, his battery ran out. Um, so that was all a bit of a, a disaster for the Brits, uh, for the Americans. Um, and although it was very much the Danish A-team versus a bit of a all-star, well, not all-stars, any comer team uh, with the American and the uh, Britain Dutch forces that were helping out there, um, in the end they were overcome but they, they put up a great defence and I think it was only in the last six minutes that the Danes managed to knock a couple of ships under the water and finally win uh, the battle. But that was a good battle, that's another good one to watch. Um, again it, it does show you how um, a battle can snowball quickly in the last 15 minutes. You lose three or four ships, it's just so important if you're a captain and your ship is knackered up 
get out of there and protect your 40 points. Um, understand that the, the clock timer, if your opponent holds all three poor, all three circles, it takes 21 minutes for them to get a thousand points. So if they hold all three and there's less than 10 minutes to go, um, they have to be over 500 to win the battle. If it's two to one, it takes 42 minutes to win the port battle. So again, if they're over 500, that means they need 21 minutes of time at the end of the battle. And there were definitely captains in here who perhaps if they hadn't lost their ships, um, maybe could have resulted in this port being held. In saying that, it was a real, there was like 14 clans and two clanless in there. So it was a real uh, great effort to hold on as long as they did. But the Danes won out there and uh, reclaimed their territory. So the US have been removed really from the entire south half of the map in a very concerted effort by the Eastern Alliance. And then, shock horrors of the week, the Eastern Alliance um, decided to have a crack at Wilmington, which is the only strong hull bonus port owned by... Actually, it's not anymore. There's one down here. But it's only one or two strong hull bonus ports owned by the Western Alliance. And it was the French who pulled the flag. Um, but this was... The screen of all screens, the Allies, uh, and it really was the Allies, it was all three nations in numbers. Um, about 60 to 70 ships um, strung out the relatively short distance. It's only a 10 minute sail between Little River and Wilmington. And uh, the Brits probably had 40 or 50 ships, uh, the Brits, the Americans and the uh, Dutch had 40 or 50 ships covering the mouth of Wilmington and this was very much because there'd been reports that a large number of ships had logged out right on the mouth ready for a, a log and pop into the port so that was to try and snaffle them. Um, there was then another ring of defenders halfway out um, and and then a large contingent sitting in front of Little River itself and many captains had essentially blockaded Little River for 24 hours to try and stop the enemy from logging out and uh, jumping into port, something I'm very much looking forward to as a fix. Um, and these guys, you know, they spent a day sitting in front of a port, snabbing up everybody who came out, which is um, a, a duty. Well done, chaps. Uh, but also good fun. It's good fun running blockades. I've done it before. Um, the French did undock a very large force, estimated at about 40 ships with screeners um, at, at Little River. And there was a number of other uh, fourth rates that were caught trying to approach Wilmington. Uh, but basically all the ships were engaged in battle and delayed too long. Um, four ships did get in by sailing around the other side of uh, Wilmington. Uh, and trying to basically enter the circle on the other side of the spit, which uh, works, but leaves you with like a 20 minute sail to get into the battle. So by the time you're there, the opponents are probably on about 800 points. Four ships got in um, and they did the right thing and ran away um, as you would. Um, and then one of the most bazookas battles of uh, the weekend down at Islamabad where the Americans were defending, and for the second time, somehow the attackers, uh, and although it was a Spanish flag, I think it was mostly uh, uh, d d Danish players, um, they somehow managed to get 26 ships in again. Now, I know that happened previously. Uh, eventually, one of them was convinced to leave. But unfortunately, a Serb joined the defensive fleet of the Americans and the Brits, and then they immediately left as well, which was rather irksome. Um, probably just a new player not knowing what they're doing or being on TeamSpeak and they've just joined the nation. Um, but this led to a bit of a problem for the defenders until Captain Asbestos stepped in. Now, Captain Asbestos uh, first appeared in Letter to the King about three weeks ago where in two different port battles, I think one at Orinoco and another perhaps at Les Cays, um, this heroic captain sailed into the enemy moor in his petrol-soaked balsa ship, only not to catch fire. Um, and, uh, and then if he did catch fire, he didn't explode for the best part of a week. 
um, and did nothing more than entertain the children sitting on the port side. Well, Captain Asbestos redeemed himself in this battle where um, spotting four or five enemies close up to the shore, he um, zipped straight towards them, uh, splashed himself in kerosene and promptly blew up and um, knocked out four or five ships. He didn't destroy them, but he, na he knackered up their sails and took a couple of hundred crew off them all. And these were all very healthy ships that he hit. Um, and so very quickly, a fifth or a sixth of the enemy fleet just became boarding targets. And to be honest, the battle, as, he, as, he, as, as Captain Asbestos went in, I think the opponents had about 600. The, the Swedes had, a, the, the, sorry, Swedes. The Spanish-led Danes had about 600 points on the board. And the American-led Brits and Dutch had about 300 points on the board. Um, and it completely turned. And um, so, uh, oh, of course, I'm talking about Costa del Fuego now. Anyway, this was the 26, 24. 24. I've just remembered that the uh, Captain Asbestos was at the next battle, which is uh, Costa del Fuego, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, what a pity I've regaled you with that wonderful story for the wrong port battle. The Brits had a crack at the uh, shallow water island quadrangle um, of Santa Fe. However, the Spanish said, no, we're hanging on to our last few ports on Cuba, thank you very much, and sent them packing. Uh, and here, this was the, the battle where Captain Asbestos uh, redeemed himself, sorry. So this was a battle where the Spanish and Danes um, uh, uh, probably 30 minutes in, 40 minutes in, it was about 600 points to 300 when Captain Asbestos defied his name, exploded all over a bunch of enemies, and turned the battle, has to be said. Um, and the Americans managed to retake Costa del Fuego, which was a, a bit of a boon, really, because they'd had a torrid week of it, as far as losing ports were concerned. Um... And so that was good news uh, for the Americans. At least it gives them a breath. Um, however, overall, the Eastern Alliance has prospered well this week. And like I say, they've, they've kicked the uh, Americans out of the southern part of the map and snaffled up some British territories up here in the north. Um, and lastly, the Brits had another go at Castries. Now, this was quite late. Um, for you Europeans, it was lovely for us in Australia. It was about 9.30 in the morning, much better than 5.30 in the morning. Uh, of course, the reason it was late is because when the Brits were running up hostility here, the French were running up anti-hostility. Um, and you know what it's like when you've got the bit between your teeth, you don't let go. Um, so this was quite late in the day. Uh, but in saying that, there were still good numbers on the servers. And the French had about three or four layers of screeners here. The Brits had a... Yeah, a bit of an average screening force, I have to admit. Um, I'm not sure where everybody was. So the screeners who were there did a great job, um, but they were basically out, out, outnumbered by layers and layers of French screeners. Um, so the good news for the French was that their screeners managed to intercept in, 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 I think they had three battles going on with the British screeners, and then they ate half the British fleet with one tag, and the other half of the British port battle fleet with the other tag. And they definitely stopped the port battle from happening. It cost them a lot of ships, it has to be said. Uh, there was a lot of first rates and a lot of second and third rates that got eaten up uh, in that defence. But Castries is safe again. And if you're a screener, you're more than happy to sell your life to defend that port battle from happening. And I think for the French, you probably wanted to go to bed. Because uh, it would have been about 1am for them on a Sunday, uh, Monday morning. Uh, not having to fight another 90 minutes in a port battle would be spiffy. Apart from the poor chap in the Constitution, who, uh, after I'd returned back and put my first rate to bed, uh, and then headed off to do some other business, about an hour later I discovered that one of the guys who'd been screening was still engaged and was being hounded by three little frigates um, who the first rates had left to chase him down. So he probably didn't get to bed till 2am protecting his Constitution. So well done. Captain Frenchy there for at least sticking it out to the bitter end. Uh, and now we come to the tragedy that is Dupe Gate. So this week it was discovered that it's possible to 
duplicate mods and it's been known by one nation in particular how to do this for quite a while and this means that some captains have got 40 or 50 uncraftable mods uh, marines carpenter teams these type of things um, now the devs who were then alerted to it when another nation got wind of this uh, have actually fixed the bug on the fly but they haven't removed the duplicated mods so although this was very much used by one nation indeed uh, not only did they do it to duplicate lots and lots of uncraftable mods they did it to duplicate craftable mods which you then break up to give you all the stuff you need to do to make a ship which saves you having to sail around and buy all your materials uh, so uh, basically guys it's cheating we're meant to be an alpha we're meant to be reporting these things not exploiting them it's not about winning at any costs so um, let's not do this the other thing is that uh, it was also discovered you could duplicate ships um, both of these were reported and both have been stopped now I believe you can't well I think you can still dupe the ships but then I don't think you can sail them out of the port uh, so they're essentially not much use although I guess you could break them up for bits save you having to earn the bits so come on devs um, let's let's stop it uh, as a player base, if you find a bug like this, don't exploit it for weeks on end and cheat. Um, I don't know, I just, uh, it must be a mentality thing. I, if, if I find out how to cheat in a game, it spoils the game for me. I, I used to play things like Civilization and SimCity and someone would teach you some, some hack code that would give you unlimited resources or some other thing, stop uprisings, and then the game's just ruined. How can you have fun sailing into a port battle when you're knee deep in yellow carpenter teams and marines um, that you've cheated to get well no you've exploited a bug but then you've not reported it and you've done it for a long time um, I mean it's cheating basically how could it be fun to win that way I just don't understand I mean for me it just is cheating winning you know this is like you play something like COD and someone's got a wall hack and they shoot you through three foot of cement or well, they can see you through walls and stuff. It just it spoils the game. I don't know where the fun is in it. So, as a player base, let's just, you know, behave a bit. And uh, if you find an exploit like this, yeah, have a bit of fun with it for a day or so. Then report it. And then give the shit back. And don't use it to spoil other people's fun. Um... And devs, I know you're probably concentrating, you've only got a few developers and you're concentrating on some lovely bit of content for us. But it, it wouldn't be hard to remove the duped carpenter teams. Every item, I'm sure, will have an internal item number. And if it's duplicated, I'm assuming they'd have the same number. Um, if not, I'm pretty sure you could determine a player who's got 50 carpenter teams or 10 carpenter teams or even more than 5 carpenter teams. Uh, probably didn't get them genuinely. No one has five carpenter teams genuine. Uh, genuine. I say no one. I'm sure there's three of you. Um, so personally, if the devs could write a bit of code to tidy up the carpenter teams to get rid of dupes, that would be great. If not, kick everybody down to no more than three sets or some bloody thing. Because um, captains sitting on carpenter teams for every ship they've got or whatever, it's just not right. Um, you essentially have to kill, um, you know, an extra 5% of your opponent's ship, and that makes a big difference. Um, and it also has a bit of an impact as well on damage caused from a couple of other things like ramming and the likes. So let's knock it on the head, chaps. Where are we expecting the action? Well, we know the Brits have run up uh Salamanca we know the Spanish are going to attack at Florida and on the north side of Cuba again uh, we know the Brits are going to go for Basseterre um oh that's last week's map um so we can expect uh combat in all the normal places Haiti um around the this sort of crescent of, of the Windward Islands uh, a bit of a surprise attack on Salamanca uh, we know the Americans are going to keep getting pounded by the Eastern Alliance who are furious at their night flipping antics. 
Uh, we know the Americans are going to keep hitting back because it's the day for them. Um, so there'll be a lot of biffo and quite a lot of change in ports. Oh, before we get there, uh, there's another port tactics out. Uh, this time it's looking at the defense of Bridgetown. Uh, so that's up on the channel if you like the port tactics things. And lastly, quite a lot of movement on the Talia Splinter's sail and blood. Uh, the Brits made a net gain of two ports, uh, taking Trinidad, covered the losses in New Providence there. Um, the Spanish made a net loss with the loss of Providence, and although they, they gained Costa del Fuego, they gave it up just before the end of the week. Uh, the French made a profit by taking Cumana off the Americans. The Danes wrecked the Americans. Um, taking three different ports off them, I think, uh, two shallows and the north of Haiti from memory. Uh, so the Americans took a shellacking. So we see the French probably doing the best they've done for ooh, at least a year, I'd say. This would be the French at the, the zenith. Uh, the Dutch still not really recovered from one of their main clans leaving. Um, and really the Dutch and the Swedes at the moment... Um, uh serving their alliances well um but probably not capable of an independent strike um so let's hope their player bases grow a little bit uh, and that's it for this week's naval action uh, a bit of news on shenanigans in the british empire a bit of news on dupe gate and all the malarkey that's been going on there this week the Revenge of the Eastern Alliance uh, against the American night flips and the surprise attacks by the Brits on Trinidad and um, stoic screening defences at Wilmington and Castries um, as well as a couple of great port battles in the mix. So I hope you enjoyed that. Give us a like, give us a subscribe. I'll see you on the ocean and I will catch you.